Okay, good morning. Um, uh, my name is Paul King. I'm going to talk to you about functional Groovy. So I'm actually not, not going to try to teach you all about the Groovy language. I'm really trying to teach you about a few simple concepts um, of functional concepts. And um, I guess my main theme is don't be scared by some of these concepts. And um, if you've got questions about it, feel free to, to ask me. I've got um, about two hours worth of uh, slides jammed there. I'm going to skip over a, a, a few of them very quickly. The whole deck will be up on SlideShare and there's a, a GitHub uh, repository with all the code examples. So stuff that I skip over, don't be worried. Um, if you're really interested in that uh, material, it'll all be there and you can shoot me an email if you've got other questions. So just a quick uh, survey. Who, who's a Java programmer in the house? Quite a few. Okay, who's a Python? Ruby, Perl, PHP, okay, C, C++, C Sharp, F Sharp, what am I, what am I missing? A few others. Okay. Uh, Scala, any Scala, any Groovy programmers? Ah, so we've got a bunch of Groovy programmers. Okay, so um, we've got a really mixed audience here, so if you've got very specific Groovy questions, fire them at me and I'll, if I can give you a simple answer, I'll, I'll give it to you straight away, otherwise see me at lunch and we can take it off board and, we, and we'll go. But uh, let's go and it thinks it's going to sleep, even though it's plugged in. Okay, mine's come back. Oh, it's back here as well. Um, so just a quick introduction. Um, I guess one of the things that I often often see is whenever a new paradigm comes out, actually th this picture here, for, for the, given there's probably some Queenslanders and New South Wales people in the audience, it probably violated the code of conduct uh, until this year. So f unfortunately, <laughs> it's no longer uh, rubbing it into the people from New South Wales that, uh, about Queensland. So I can now freely show this picture and it, it only um, brings pain to us Queenslanders, but there's always next year. Um, so. Um, what, I, what we frequently find, and it's, it's something that is way too common in our industry, is that whenever a new technology or a new paradigm or, or um, some new way of doing things uh, comes about, we have to almost rubbish the old style of doing things. And in fact, usually, as you know, I've seen many, many uh, technologies, many languages, many paradigms uh, come and go, and each one is usually a step forward. But usually you'll get most bang for buck if you bring on board the old stuff, the good things about the old things you've done, as well as the really wonderful new things that you're learning. And um, un unfortunately, that tends to not be uh, the case with um, how our industry works. You know, if, if I rock up to one of the Queensland government departments here and say, I've got this wonderful course, I'm going to charge you know, X thousand dollars per student, and it's going to make your programmers 2% more productive. They're going to say, go away, um, don't, don't come back. I've, I've got to go and propose to them, oh, everything that your programmers have ever learned in the past is rubbish. They're about to, you know, ev everything that you, you're coding is going to fall to bits and pieces. Um, you know, it, it, it is a nightmare about to happen. And then they might say, oh, okay, well, we might spend a little bit of our budget. And it's, it's really unfortunate that we have to do that. And we have to somehow find a way out of that uh, that uh, um, paradigm, uh, that, that, that fact of life. We've, we've, we've really got to get into a mode of continuous learning and uh, that's where we need to be. So that's, that's the approach I'm coming uh, into this with. So I'm not going to tell you that functional programming makes everything you've ever learned obsolete, but it's got some really wonderful properties associated with it that you should take on board and it's really useful to, to go and do that. Now just to um, emphasize that point, don't worry about the, the, you won't be able to read the fine print on, on that um, chart. There'll be, there will be a test, of course, before you leave the room, but um, don't be too worried. What, what, what the interesting thing here is that these are, are different um, programming paradigms, and the ones over on the left-hand side are ones that uh, don't really have much state or don't emphasize state. The ones on the right-hand side do. So functional is sort of a, a bit of the yellowy and orangey stream that comes through here. 
imperative and OO is sort of the pinky purple bits that come here, but it's actually, there's actually a very rich set of properties about programming languages that you can look at and analyze and say, well, it actually, once you add closures to, you know, in this box here, we've got Java and OCaml, which are, one's deemed to be a functional language and one's deemed to be imperative, but they fall into the same box here. Sometimes the way they got to that box was different. You added closures first and then you added continuations or then you added state or whatever. Um, so you might have actually uh, come up with a language by uh, different means, but it turns out that there's many interesting properties of languages and we shouldn't characterize things as just this or that. Um, there's a little URL there. You'll be able to, you won't be able to read that, but you'll be able to go and look at these slides later and pull that down if you're interested. The, the, the thing that I take away, you know, I like Groovy because it lets me play around on three quarters of that little spectrum of, of graphs there by applying a bit of discipline. I can't, Groovy doesn't naturally fall into all, many of those boxes, but with a little bit of discipline, it can actually do nearly every one of those boxes. But the other thing that's very interesting there is that there's some more languages that I need to go and uh, I've, I've looked at before, like Oz and Alice, that, I'll, that actually cover a lot of boxes, so they'll be worth me going back and trying to uh, have a look at where they are and, and uh, playing with them a little bit more too is quite interesting. And it's falling asleep again. I think it's coming back. Okay, another very interesting thing that um, I, w I was at uh, Strange Loop, uh, not this year, but last year, and another thing that I found very interesting was the, one of the talks on stratified languages. Now, what's that? Um, those of you who know Haskell, it's, it's, it's slightly stratified in that it's got a way of uh, working with it that's purely functional, and then there's these back doors to do non-purely functional things. If you've heard of monads and things like that, I'm not going to try to... Um, go into that in any detail, but but if if you're still puzzled by the end, you can come and come and ask me. This is, keeps blinking on and off. It's a bit. Um, I believe it's all powered on. It. Um, let me just quickly. It thinks it's powered on. 94% plugged in charging, but anyhow, we shall persevere and uh, put up with it. Um, anyway, to cut a long story short, there are languages that um, allow you to have strict modes of working and less strict modes of working. And you're not getting it? No, there it comes, it's coming back. Um, you can actually have languages that are um, yeah. uh, not just two modes of working, strict and non-strict, but actually there's a whole lot of symmetries about languages. How do you do error handling? How do you do concurrency? How do you handle um, pure functions? Can you do anything special with them? Is the ordering of statements uh, important or not? And depending on um, those different aspects of languages, what we might find in the future is that you can actually put your programming language into multiple modes of operation. And in, when you're in a certain mode, you'll be only doing pure functional stuff and there'll be huge amounts of optimizations that the compiler can make. And when you put it into some other mode, you'll be able to relax things a little bit and, and, and do things in a more flexible way. And we'll, um, this, this language here is a research language. You can't um, go and uh, use it easily today yourself, but you'll find that the ideas that are in um, some of these uh, this research area will slowly percolate their way into, into our languages. I think there's some very interesting stuff there. Okay, so um, now what is functional programming? We've, we've gone a little bit into the talk and uh, we haven't really tried to define what functional programming is. Um, there's a lot of ways that you could, uh, you could, a lot of jargon you could mention, you could say that a functional language should have lots of these things, but I'm just gonna give a very simple definition Functional programming is something that favours evaluation of composable expressions over execution of commands. So who, who in the room would call themselves a functional programmer? Not very many hands up. Who's used SQL in the room? Every, every hand goes up. So does SQL go and tell the database how to traverse the rows to get information out, or does it declare in, <laughs> in expressions, um, which you can't see, um, in composable expressions, joining fragments of queries together, 
how to, uh, what you actually want out of the database. So it's, it's the what and the how. So you've, you're all functional programmers, you've all used SQL. Um, so functional programming is all about taking that idea and putting that into your, your programming code as well. Should I just swap to a different resolution? Do you reckon that might help? That's what I've got it as. I'll, car I'll, I'll carry on and... Um, It's on the 720. Yeah. It's on duplicate, which is the dumbest. Yeah. I can do it, force it on to just the. You can always extend it and just push it off to the. Message. I'll try right. that, which means I won't see anything. I but you, hopefully, you better that way. You might see it, yeah. but I can't. And where is it? Before it times out, quick. Did I get it? Yeah. Okay. And back to hopefully. It'll make it a bit harder for me to switch over to coding mode, but um, I now I've got, it's gone back to presentation mode here, which is different to, anyway, okay. <laughs> we'll see what happens, we'll see what happens with this. Um, yeah. I think we might be okay again, just so just see how we go. It it's been flicking all over the place. Um, yeah, so what we want to do is get that same style um, and get that into our code as well. And it turns out that with this particular, if you adopt this particular style of uh, tweaking your code in this particular way, there's different levels of reuse that you can obtain, um, different kinds of errors that you might expect to yeah, see. Yeah, I'm going to do that in the entire presentation, right? So, can you copy your slides to the? You want to type, don't you? I was going to try to do code, but maybe I won't be able to do code. Um, can I try play that? You can play. You can play. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll keep keep going. Um, it, so it turns out if we if we adopt this functional style, there's certain kinds of errors. You know, at the if you look at your uh, typical programs involving objects at the moment, if you've adopted very high discipline then your objects will talk to one another in simple ways. The state that's inside your objects will be very well disciplined. You'll know what the invariants are of your objects. And, and you can um, uh, reason about your code fairly easily, but it's just so easy in an OO language to start being sloppy with what the actual invariants of your program are, with what the, um, what's happening in the state. And so, it makes it much, much harder to reason about the code and to test the code. So if I've um, got an object and I call it with certain parameters and something comes back and I've got a unit test that covers that, if there's internal state and that state changes, if I run that test again, will the test now fail? So um, that doesn't mean that OO is bad, it's just that whoever wrote that particular OO that has that state that interacts in that way may not have been as disciplined as they could be. So you can be very, very disciplined and use OO. If you go and use a language that uh, encourages some of the functional techniques, then a lot of these things will, um, will be perhaps uh, forced upon you or at least encouraged by the particular style of, of using things. So if I start uh, using immutable uh, collections and other things that we'll hopefully talk about, um, then I won't be able to go and change something uh, in that collection in, in an in, inappropriate way, and it means that I can start using that collection in a multi-threaded environment and so forth. So functional programming is going to bring a lot of benefits. It doesn't mean that OO is uh, bad or imperative is bad, it's just that um, some of the discipline that I'd need to bring on board to make that OO work comes f for free to some extent with functional. Now, going back to what I said before, whenever, whenever something new comes out, it always looks better. What we'll find over time is one, um, there's a whole lot of, uh, d if you like, design patterns that you use in functional programming things. Uh, we'll look at, monad look at monoids very quickly, but there's monads, applicatives, functors, a whole bunch of things. They're all design patterns that you can use to get um, more complex. Sir, I can do nothing about that. Someone's laptop will probably have to be used. Okay. Um, yeah, the equipment, it sucks. I can't change it, so. 
Yep. Just make the best of it. It's not very many of us here, Paul. We could all just come to the front and hold <laughs> <laughs> the laptop up. Bill's got a nice big screen. We can write it on the board, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I could just, just about do that. I mean, you've got a clicker, right? Yeah, yeah. Let me try something else. You hold on to that. Okay. I'm going to try something. Get everyone to. to uh, it's not, um, I won't do much live coding, but I, I need a wireless it's keyboard. It's not essential this is recorded either, um, Ryan. Uh, well, no, no, it's, it's the, the recordings. The on, to be clear, the recordings on the problem here. It's, yeah, it's, no, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, I understand. If you want to. I was only now rerouting it. So yeah, yeah. yeah. If you want running, so. Cool. Okay, where am I up to in, in my talk? <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Skills. Yep, I can, I can do it all on the fly if I have to. <laughs> well, give it one second and then I'll just keep going. Okay, cool. Okay, we, th we think that's going to be better. Just click on the... Okay. Um, so this idea of uh, declarative versus imperative is nothing new. Um, I, I don't know if any of you remember Star Trek IV, but there's a scene in Star Trek IV where um, uh, Scotty's wanting the computer to do something, so he picks up the mouse and starts talking to it as if it's a microphone. And um, it uh, doesn't do everything. It's, it's actually a Mac 1. The, the very first time I used this picture in a presentation, uh, it was one hour to go on the, the eBay auction to sell that computer. So I was tempted, should I, should I actually buy the computer and then I could, I could have it there in, when I give this talk, but um, I stuck to the, the talk and uh, I, I don't know what happened to it, but anyhow. Um, yeah, so it's, it's nothing new and um, what it's, there's nothing, um, in some ways there's nothing um, particular about functional programming that, that's making it declarative. You can write in logic programming languages in a very declarative way. SQL can be very declarative or you can, you can bend it if you want as well. And um, yeah, typically though functional, if you've got a, a language that's, um, that enforces functional characteristics, you won't be able to do anything but use um, a declarative style. So you won't be able to have for loops with a counter that changes because that's, that's mutable state. So you uh, won't be able to do that. So there are techniques using um, internal iterators and other things that you can use instead. You can use recursion and other things. So, so um, what are the downsides to, to doing things? It's a new way of thinking. If you've never written recursive functions before, you'll, you'll, you'll pull your hair out the first few times you have a look at them. Sometimes it actually makes code less easy to understand because um, one, of the, one of the things that doesn't happen automatically out of the box, moving to a functional language doesn't necessarily mean the compiler can make your code efficient. Now, um, you, often that's not a huge concern, but sometimes it, it is a concern and um, you'll be able to, because imperative is closer to the bare bones of the machine than functional, you can often optimize things by hand yourself um, in an imperative way that is much harder to do when you're doing functional. But it's, um, I, I, anyone who's too worried about that, I, uh, there's a very famous quotes about premature optimization that I would point you to, and usually it's not a problem. Um, okay, well, I was going to start typing some stuff and running some stuff, but I'll, 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 I'll do this for now. Um, so let, before we, let's just dive in and start doing some stuff. Um, so this is what uh, a closure looks like in Groovy. Which so a how is this different from other things? So a closure is uh, basically a code block. Now, if you're using um, Ruby or something else, it'll look different, um, but it'll have the, it's the same concept in that. Um, if I was using a procedural language, I can write procedures. Those procedures stick inside my program. If I'm writing an object-oriented program, I can write classes. Inside those classes, I can have methods. But those methods are stuck inside that object. There's not much I can do um, with uh, those methods apart from using them inside that object. I can call them from outside, but they sort of um, 
remain inside there. There's no way, for instance, so here's a variable. There's no way I could d d uh, assign a variable to a method within a class. Okay, now, Java 8's a different story. Let's not go there if you're, if you're gone, uh, jumping ahead. But um, what uh, we want to do is have chunks of code be first class citizens. Okay, and that's all a closure is, that's all a function is, what's f uh, it's, it's the key premise behind functional programming. So this is a block of code, and I'm assigning it to a variable here. Now, th just a bit on the syntax, because I don't want to lose you, even though it's not all that important for this talk. Um, the little arrow, arrow that's in the middle here is uh, splitting up the arguments from th the code that's going to get executed. So, is that a question? Um, so in this particular case, we've got a twice closure, a twice function, that takes one parameter num and returns the num added to itself. Okay, so um, that's now in the twice variable, but I can actually call that as if it, lo it looks sort of like a method call. So invoking twice on with the parameter five feeds that into this chunk of code and 10 is the result of executing that function. It's just a shorthand in Groovy for a dot call. So it is actually a, a, a Java object um, paradigm that's underneath this, but you don't normally need to see that or worry about that. Now, here I used int as the type of my parameter. I can leave the uh, type of the parameters off in Groovy. You can leave it off altogether or use a keyword def, which means you don't care about the type. You want dynamic typing. Um, if there's no arguments, I can put nothing in front of the arrow here. I could just leave this arrow off and there would be a default argument and I don't have to use the argument. Um, it's just typically nicer to, uh, if you don't have any arguments, to, to express it this way. So here, 20 is twice 10, which is just going to invoke that bit of code. More examples. Um, here is a version. So this version here, I had a typed argument. Here's one. I didn't bother typing it. I can call triple. Um, this is also triple. If I don't specify any arguments, I said there's a default. So if you, this is a, is a, um, a reference to your current object. It is a reference to the current iteration of a bit of code or the, the, the current uh, closure itself, often uh, used for iterating things. So um, it is the, uh, the keyword that gets used for, as the default parameter. Okay, other languages might use an underscore and things like that. Um, so we can call that as well. When we're defining our functions, we can use other functions. So defining a closure in terms of another closure here, that's fine as well. And we can have default not, it's not all that important. Um, Groovy will let you have default values for arguments. So if I call it with 5, quadruple 5 will be 20. But if I don't supply any arguments, I'll get the default and I'll get uh, quadruple of 2. Okay, so, so they're not, it's not all that important, but it's different languages will, will support different things. So um, what we're going to have, uh, we can actually, like we can assign a chunk of code to a variable, we can pass in a chunk of code to a method. So this is a method that might exist in a script or in an object. And I can pass in a closure. I can type it or not type it. And I can call that closure passing in a parameter. Okay? And so I can call with five and pass in triple that we, was the, the code we defined before, and it'll call it. Okay, more examples. Um, this is just a method. Instead, it's, like, it's like this one here. So in very many ways, the, a closure looks like a method, and they, you can use them interchangeably in many places, but uh, closure is a first-class citizen. You can compose closures together, functions together. So I can take the twice closure and compose it with another twice closure, and that'll give me quadruple of something. So if I call uh, quadruple of something with, with a parameter, that, that's what I'll get. You can uh, do partial evaluation. So there's a, um, I can basically um, partially apply parameters to any, any closure. Um, there's a long discussion about currying and other things that I'll, I'll not talk about right now. But um, if you want to, uh, if you've got a, a bunch of parameters to a closure, so what, what, might, what might not have been, um, Obvious, I haven't shown any examples yet. Um, you can have more than one uh, parameter to a closure. Okay, so you can have multiple uh, arguments. 
and um, what you can do is fill in any of those arguments. You can fill in from the left or the right or a specific one. Okay, so you can do a left curry, a right curry, or an n curry. And so if I take quadruple and automatically supply the argument of 10, I'll get um, 40. And once we have um, these bits of code, they're first class citizens, they can sit inside data structures like lists, and I can call collect on it and um, call each of those bits of code passing in the parameter 5, and I'll get results back. Okay, so anywhere where you'd use a, a variable, pass a parameter, um, you can use uh, one of these closures. So this is definitely a, a first class citizen. And we've already seen it, but I haven't made it obvious. Um, we have actually got higher order functions because we can pass functions into functions. So I've got an apply twice uh, function or closure here. It takes an argument and some closure, and it calls closure on that argument and then closure on the result of that. Okay, so that's just a higher order function. If you hear that, it's nothing magical. It's just allowing functions to have functions as parameters. Okay, now it turns out to be a very um, powerful feature that we may see more examples of later, but um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, cut, we'll see, how far, see how far we get. Okay, now closures are used just everywhere throughout Groovy. I'm gonna skip through these slides really, really quickly, but Basically, you've got chunks of code. Everything between the brackets here is a bit of code. So when you've got markup builders in Groovy, um, these are methods with clo taking closures as parameters that have methods that take closures as parameters inside them and so on, and you can in intermix that with normal uh, code. Okay, the way Groovy does its resource handling, if you've ever done uh, Java, well, certainly, uh, early versions of Java, at least, the resource handling is very, very painful. Um, the, the way Groovy uh, works is it a, has a whole bunch of helper methods that take closures uh, in them. So there's an each line method that takes a chunk of code that's a closure. Okay, and it'll, it'll iterate through your, a whole file, apply your bit of code to each line, and then tidy up after itself when it's finished. So things that were you know, pages of uh, Java code become just a couple of lines. And many of the DSL tricks that uh, Groovy is very, very, it's one of its sweet spots is creating domain specific languages. So these are little mini languages that allow um, at some sort of domain expert to express the, their, their ideas very, very fluently. I don't wanna, we do a whole talk on that as well, but I don't wanna go into the details, but this here is Groovy code. Please show the square root of 100. This happens to be the implementation of a little DSL. And the way it's implemented, I'm using some metaprogramming and, and little closures and things. Well, actually, there's no metaprogramming in this one. There's a metaprogram on the next slide. But um, the fact that I've got closures allows me to support uh, little implementations here. If you're wondering what it uh, gets passed as it's, it's that, you don't need to put in all the, the punctuation. Okay, if you're wondering where, where uh, this example was inspired from, the day after we uh, had support for, for, for these uh, command chains, uh, this example showed up on a Japanese website. So within one day, they'd already started writing out uh, Japanese DSLs, um, making use of the f features of the language. So it was, it's, it's, it's uh, quite a nifty way of, uh, of um, making... Uh, little languages that you could put in front of a business user and things like that, or use for testing purposes and so on. Um, um, it's, it, to be honest, it's, it's huge uses are in Grails and in Gradle, yeah. <laughs> but it is actually used uh, quite a bit in testing and um, in small pockets in other places. So there's a lot of cases where people have got like uh, business rules for insurance policies and so on. And when you want the actual rule that you're feeding into your system to be in a form that your insurance actuary or whatever will be able to, to read and, and verify, yes, that's the exact rule that we're applying. Um, this sort of style makes it a lot easier uh, to, to, to get that feedback. Now you can, there, there's plenty of circumstances when you can show them a pure functional programming language and get away with it. There's other times when 
this sort of simplified uh, version of things uh, works out really nicely. Okay, um, now the, again, this would be a, a big topic. Um, I've got four or five examples of this in the GitHub site, but just to, um, turns out, and this, this is um, always is, seems to be the case whenever we um, take a step forward in, in our paradigms or in our languages, many of the things that we thought were good design patterns turned out to be trivially easy to do without the design pattern. And this is a particular example that happens to be um, using a, replacing the strategy pattern with just a bunch of closures. And it's basically the strategy pattern becomes obsolete, as does the command pattern, as does many of the patterns you would use for in traditional Java and from the Gang of Four book um, aren't re really required at all once, you've, once you have closures available to you. Okay. Um, now, one of the things that I haven't really stressed much yet is um, some of the important things that you'd typically like in uh, that functional languages tend to stress, and you might want to know why. Um, so let's have a look at an example. Normally, if I've got a bit of code here, and I've got a variable x, and it's got a value of 4, and then I go and define some increment uh, function and run the function, I'd expect x hasn't changed. Right? If, however, increment actually had some sort of side effect in there, form may have changed, and that would make my code very hard to read. So it would be very, very poor imperative programming if I did that. Um, but um, Groovy will let you, and as will imperative languages, they will let you. Well, actually, any, any language will let you. It's just much, much harder in some languages than others to have side effects. So um, if I've got these kind of side effects, I run this thing with a side effect, and it's, it's going and incrementing x while it's doing the calculation then things aren't going to be what I expect later on. And now this comes back to, in, in OO, you would have been taught good style was single responsibility principle and things like that. Um, this is violating all the good style of OO. Um, but functional languages would take, often take it a step further and they will just not let you uh, do this sort of thing at all. They won't let you get access to... Um, this kind of state. So you, if you're starting to adopt a functional style, you'll start removing state even from your you know, Java or Groovy or whatever uh, language you're going to use, uh, Ruby, um, you can start removing the state and uh, you, it'll be much, much harder to do things like this that'll look like they're wacky. Now why is this important? Let's have a look at a slightly bigger example. It's only very slightly bigger. Um, it's the same thing again, but I'm, I've got some code and I'm going to set some variable x to be y plus 1. I'm going to run some method and then I'm going to say z equals y plus 1. Now, if this method, if I know this method has no side effects, then if I'm a smart compiler, I can say, ah, oh, I've already calculated y plus 1 here. Why go and calculate it again at this point? Whatever I got for for, as the result of that calculation at this point, which is now stuffed in X, I can stuff that straight into Z. So this is a trivial little teeny weeny example, but compilers are very, very good at looking at code and seeing uh, anywhere where optimizations can take place. But if method can have side effects, all bets are off. They cannot do this kind of optimization. And you might think, well, this is so trivial. Yeah, I'm adding one to a variable. I haven't lost much if I do that twice. But in reality, you can analyze whole uh, big sub-expressions. And I might have some sub-expression here. But, you know, I've got some constants. They're, they're constants in, um, in Java or, or Groovy. And I'm feeding them into a, um, some sort of function here, which I've got the code for. The compiler can actually do that entire calculation at compile time and just substitute the answer in because if it knows that everything's going to be pure when, when it gets applied here. Right? If, if, if these are all pure functions, the result of running this at runtime or at compile time is going to be the same. So I can actually take huge big chunks of code and replace them with the constant values pre-calculated ahead of time. I can start doing smarter caching. I'll, I'll come back to that, you know, come to your question in a tick. And, um, 
there's a whole lot of uh, really, really smart things that I can do. Um, I, I'll, I'll take your question now. There's something else I was going to okay, think. I understand the principle. Do uh, the Groovy implementations at the moment do that? No. Um, opportunity. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, if, if you look at things like um, uh, Frege, which is a, a Haskell-like uh, language on the JVM, um, it demarcates code as pure and non-pure, and it's starting to do this sort of thing. Um, the, the, we're looking at that and seeing if we can bring some of those ideas over, but it probably will be a while before we get around to it. But there might be some experimental... Um, F-R-E-G-E. -E. I'm not sure how exactly how you pronounce it, but it's, it's a Haskell-like thing for the, the JVM. F-R-E-G-E. -E. Yeah. Frege? I, I, um, yep. The Europeans can uh, pronounce it much better than I can, so it's, it comes from there. Um, the other thing that you can do, which, which you can't, um, if you've got dead code, you can eliminate it at uh, compile time because you can tell by looking at the analysis of the code, this cannot possibly be executed. Whereas if there's side effects going on, state might change in such a way that, oh, well, this might get executed in some weird circumstance and I can't really tell. So there's a lot of optimizations. Um, now this, this thing is, you'll hear people talk about reference or transparency. It basically just means um, whenever I can see one term and I know it's going to be assigned some other value, I can replace it with what that value is going to be. Right? And that's, it's a feature that uh, functional languages um, the strict functional languages will um, enforce upon you and it's got many, many benefits in terms of optimization and reasoning about code. Okay, now um, I'll quick, I might quickly, how are we going? I'll jump over here, bear with me as I... What I wanted to do, um, and I'm not sure I'll do all of these examples now, but I'll see whether this, now that it's gone out of presentation mode, I don't know whether it's going to flick that over anymore. It doesn't. So we'll try force it. I don't know what res it's going to think it's at, but we'll do it one step at a time. Oh, yes, we're back. Um, and because my mouse is unplugged, I can't increase the font size, but we'll get there. Okay, um, what I wanted to do here, now what I've got is I've got a, turns out, I've just got a little example that involves calculating primes and calculating palindromes. <coughs> Didn't get echo feedback there. Um, the details of it aren't all that important, um, but I just wanted to show you the kind of thing that you can do in your code if you're trying to change the style of it. And I've got more examples of this later on, but we're going to run out of time, I imagine, before I get to show them all, so we'll, we'll have a look. It turns out having a factor efficient factorial function is, is very nice for calculating primes, so that's what this little thing up there is. Don't worry about the details. I've just got some numbers, 100 to 200. And it turns out that if you take the factorial of um, the one below a number and add one, and if that's divisible by the number, then you've got a prime. Okay, so this turns out to be a very efficient way to tell if something's a prime or not. A palindrome is very easy. If you just print the two string out and reverse it, it's the same as the original two string. So I've, I've just got two little closures here that um, tell if something is a prime and if it is a palindrome. Now, if, you, if you've got an imperative style, um, here's how we might do it. We might, um, we've got some mutable lists. So we'll start off, 
setting them to empty and then we'll use a bit of um, imperative code here to walk through the list. So we've got a, and um, I don't think I can, oh, the laser just gets over there, we'll see how we go. So I've got a mutable counter here, I, which is gonna run through the loop and I'm gonna pull a number out and then I'm gonna check if it's a prime and if it is, I'm gonna add it into my list. If it's a palindrome, I'm gonna add it to this list. And if it's both of them, I'll add it into the, uh, the both list. So that's, that's um, my first imperative attempt at calculating something that's um, showing me these things. Is, can anyone see any optimizations that you might want to do for this bit of code, even imperative style wise? So yeah, we're calling uh, is prime and is palindrome twice. So yep, the very first thing you could do is say yeah, well let's let's that's pretty inefficient. We've already calculated them. Um, Why well, calculate them again? So yeah, we could just have a little boolean say, and um, then based on the value of those booleans, we can uh, stash things away. But it's still very imperative. We've got a for loop here with a mutating uh, counter on it. So how would we take it further? Well, it turns out you just, just go uh, nums.findall is prime, and that's your answer. So that's the imperative way of doing things. So find all is, so nums is a, is a collection, and on all collections in Groovy, and you'll, you'll see similar things uh, in other languages, you'll have what's called an internal iterator. So this is a thing that will iterate over all of the things inside the list, and what does it do each time it iterates over them? You've got to give it the code to do. And so we're going to give it the code is prime and it'll do it for each of the numbers. Okay. Now, remember how we, um, we did a little optimization here with our, uh, we saved away some booleans and that allowed us to optimize the imperative one. We've kind of uh, lost the ability to do that by going to functional here, right? So I can do find all is prime, find all is palindrome, and I can do find all the ones that are both. And it looks like we might have uh, lost the ability to optimize this easily. But it turns out there's usually nice way, nicer ways to do it than what the imperative was anyway. So if we just take the primes and intersect them with the palindromes, we'll get the ones that are both. Okay. So when you start moving things over to a functional style, you might think, oh no, I'm losing control. I haven't got the low level details of rank. And you, you might be worried that you won't be able to optimize things. Usually there's, there's nice ways to do things that you end up with code that's easier to understand. Find all, find all, intersect. You know, that's fairly easy to understand. And you get rid of the, um, the mutable state. You can get rid of all that altogether. So you can don't have an empty list and add things to it. You can immediately assign all the primes to be this calculation here and so on. Okay. Once we have lists that uh, they can be immutable, then um, that gives us many advantages. Okay, so let me see if this... I don't know how to flick tabs when I'm in presentation mode. So some of the other things that uh, happen when you move over to a functional style that you might be worried about is, because I said you're getting the compiler to try to optimize, so you're just trying to be declarative. Give me this answer, not how to do it. So in some sense, you're, you're giving up uh, your rights as a program to tell it what to do, what tell the, um, the computer what to do, and you're hoping that the compiler is efficient enough. And so things like recursion can often be inefficient, and often the uh, ways in which certain, if you do a, a recursive uh, Fibonacci or something, um, the naive way to do that, or factorial, will potentially calculate the terms over and over again that you've already, you know, so if, if you know factorial, um, you multiply, or oh, Fibonacci, you'll multiply n by n minus 1 and things like that, and then to do n minus 1, you do n minus 1 times n minus 2. So you'll do all the terms at least twice if you do the naive approach. Now, if you're doing it imperatively, you can optimize this by hand and you can store a cache away of all the, all the things that you need. Turns out that functional languages will give you that ability as well. So th th in this little example here, now I, I, I won't, given the time we've got, I won't, I won't draw you through this um, one step at a time, but I've got a little bit of function, uh, some code here. It, 
and it's forcing, uh, I'll just um, take that one, un uncomment that one. So I've just got some standard code that I might write. This is just uh, working out the uppercase of a character, which is something fairly trivial. But to, to make it look like it's a slow operation, I've just added in a bit of a sleep. And if, if I run a bit of code to find the, um, collect the uppercase letters of all the things that's in this word, it'll be quite slow because there's 18 characters, whatever it is, and each one will sleep for half a second, so it'll take nine seconds to calculate this. If I just throw dot memwise on it, it'll auto cache this function. And there happens to be nine distinct, no, seven distinct uh, letters in that thing, so it'll only take three and a half seconds instead of nine seconds. And I don't have to worry about the caching, I just say memwise this. And you can do it via a function, a dot memwise uh, method call on any closure, and there's annotations, you can do it on objects as well, on your methods. Okay. Um, Recursion as well is an area that can potentially be um, very, very slow, but can also give you uh, stack overflows. So if you write a naive factorial and then try to find the factorial of a big number of 1,000, which has got 2,000 digits in it or whatever, you can easily uh, overflow your stack. Groovy's stack is um, less efficient than Java's. It's, depending on the circumstances, three to seven times more things on a Groovy stack than a Java stack. Well, Compile Static is probably very close again now. Um, but in any case, both of them will overflow at uh, some large number. And by doing things like tail recursion, uh, you can get rid of that problem. But not every uh, method that you write using recursion is easy to do tail recursion on. So if you've got mutual functions calling one another, they don't, can't be necessarily automatically or easily automatically uh, converted into something that can be uh, a tail call. Actually, I should just ask, who knows what tail recursion sort of is? So you kind of understand the problem we're solving? Because a couple of hands that didn't go up, I don't know whether you're just snoozing before lunch or... Um, but anyhow, to, I'll do the simplified version of this. Um, Tail recursion can be a problem. Groovy, as like uh, many of the languages, have little tricks you can do, uh, trampolining and auto-analyzing code to do smart things with tail recursion. So you can turn those on and get, get along, a long way. Okay, so um, if I go back to, I think I've got one example coming up. Yeah, so uh, I'll go back to slide mode and I've gone back to there, but that's all right. Okay, so um, just by putting this uh, tail recursive annotation on um, this bit of code here, it'll automatically do all the smart tail recursion things uh, that's required, or complain that it can't do it in, in certain circumstances. Okay, I've got two examples um, that I want to talk about and i um, trying to think through how we're going to do this in the simplest amount of time. Maybe I'll do them all from this, I'll do the first one all from this slide if I can, we'll see how we go. So when you start moving over to functional programming, one of the things that will be stressed is immutability. Now there's a nice annotation in Groovy at immutable that'll let you make all your objects immutable if you need to. So that's, that's um, go and do that to your domain objects where it makes sense. But the other big place where immutability comes ab about um, is collection types. So the built-in Java collections are not immutable. There is some wrapper classes that will make them immutable. If you do dot as immutable on, a, on a, any collection in, in Java or in Groovy, you'll get the wrapper classes. But um, they'll only take you so far. It turns out, well, let's just walk through this. Suppose I've got... Um, I'm going to treat a string as if it's an array of characters here. So I'm storing uh, two letters, C and A, and now I'm going to store a third letter, T. If I've just got a mutable collection type, it'll just be some array of some kind, and I'll just go and sp splatter another one in there. And so that mutates. This is super efficient to implement. It's very, very um, easy for the compilers to do, for, to write the code for, for those collection types. But if, if people have uh, 
got, if different people have got uh, references to this collection and they're all trying to update it at the same time in different threads or whatever, I can have uh, huge uh, threading problems. And um, it can be very, very hard to reason about what's actually happening to those collection types over time. So one of the things I can do is move over to using immutable collections. The simplest way is you can just go dot as immutable and so on, or, or, or use Google's immutable classes or, or, or so on. And what will happen then is uh, if I've got a collection with two letters in it and I want to add a third one, I uh, won't touch the original collection at all. I'll create a brand new one that has all three in it. And anyone who's pointing to the old one will remain pointing to the old one and they'll just have the two letters. And at some point I've got to coordinate how people can see the uh, all three letters if they need to. So I've, I've um, made it things nicer for myself in that I've got a, a collection here that never changes, C and A. People that don't want it to change will be happy. I've now got a CAT with three letters. The people that don't want that to change will be happy. So I can reason about a lot of things. I've got to do some other coordination now if I want people to know about changes. Now I've got to propagate those changes. And usually when you're using functional uh, programming, you'll use things like actors and whatever to do the coordination rather than having that sort of thing inside your code. But that, that's beyond what I want to talk about. Um, there's a third style though, and it turns out to be the, a more efficient one and, and what you're probably going to want to do, and that's what's called persistent collections. Okay, and uh, that's the way you really want to go, and that'll be a tree-based uh, representation of your data structures. And they try to get you the best of both worlds in that there's a lot of duplication here. I've gone and stored the C and the A, and I'm going to have to re repeat that and add the T. And so every time I'm making new ones of these, I'm doing lots of copying, and there's more memory being taken up if people are still referring to the old one and it can't get garbage collected. Um, whereas the, the persistent data structures, now the word pers the persistent uh, that is in the title of this style of collection has nothing to do with databases. Okay, I probably should just sort of uh, stress that. The persistent here is, what it means is, one, whenever I put something into this collection type, it'll persist. Yep. So, um, it, uh, I can come and make changes to this. People that are looking at the old stuff will still see what, what they were referring to, and new people will see new stuff, um, and there'll be sharing of common data structure. Uh, structures and paths within those data structures. So people have gone and created some smart data structures, that B trees and finger trees and a whole bunch of things underlying these that allow um, new data structures to be defined in terms of old data structures. Okay, so I'm going to skip over these slides and try to show you just the benefit of, uh, well, what's going to happen when you try to use these things. Um, this is, I'm pulling, I'm going to use the persistent data structures out of a thing called functional Java, but there's a whole bunch of different ones that you can use. Um, here I've got a pets, I've got three pets, a cat, a dog and a horse, a cat, a dog and a horse. And if someone else wants some, uh, another list of pets that has a fish as well, then I'll create a new list, fish will go in here and then the tail of, of uh, fish will point to the original list. Okay, so it's very efficient to insert onto the, uh, the head of this sort of structure. Anyone who's still referring to the old one will still see the old structure as it is. All the stuff that's shared uh, it will remain in place. So that's super, super efficient for certain kinds of operations. But if I now I did want to go and do a remove uh, of horse, what it means is, and that's only on new pets, what it means is I've actually got to go and replicate part of the data structure because anyone who's pointing to the old pets still needs to see the old pets including, um, hang on, what have I done? I've, new pets, oh remaining is the new pets without the um, a horse. So anyone who's po looking at the remaining pets will see the uh, original ones without the horse but anyone looking at the original pets will still see the horse. Does that make sense? So the thing, so it looks like it's there's a whole lot of complex stuff that's happened here. The thing is, all of that's happened underneath the covers. And these, uh, 
the data structures that are under here have been highly optimized. And in fact, you've probably, again, if I asked you if you've used these, you'd probably say no. And then if I asked you if you've, if you've used MongoDB or whatever, you'd say yes. So this is what's sitting under many of the NoSQL databases. Very, very smart data structures that are doing this kind of optimization for you. So they're doing their hardest um, to, uh, whenever there's data that can be shared, it will be shared, and when it can't be, it'll do the right things to, to, to uh, copy and uh, move things around. Okay, there's just another example of it there. So um, I'm just about out of time. What I'm going to do is jump forward to one more example to just give you a flavor. I'll, I'll show you one more slide. Turns out that once you start making things into nice little bits of functions, it becomes very, very easy to um, parallelize things. So typically when I've got uh, collections of data, I will want to maybe split the data into pieces, I want to transform the data, I want to um, do maybe multiple transformations, I want to get a subset of that data, I want to reduce the data into some sort of answer. If, it, if, if it, it turns out that if each of the little pieces that I want to do here is, is one of those pure functions, I can often do this sort of thing in parallel. Okay, and there's, there's some code here that uh, you can go look at the code and um, it'll show you examples of, of doing that. There's some data flow examples there as well. But um, What I wanted to do now is just show you one sort of example of um, pushing things. It's, it's, it's actually a hybrid OO and functional style. And let's just see where it takes us if we start pushing things in that direction. Um, what we've got is, so this was again a, uh, another strange loop talk from 2010 that, that uh, Guy Steele gave a very nice talk about the Fortress language, and that's a little um, Fortress implementation of, of this problem. But we'll skip over that, and here's a groovy implementation that solves this problem. Now, what the problem is, is I've got a string, and I want to count up the uh, number of words that are in there. Right? And I've got many, many cores available to me. Now, how might you go about doing this? Well, all the naive ways of doing this, it becomes a sequential process because when I look at a chunk here, I don't really know what happened on the previous chunk. Yeah? And so I can't start this chunk until I know what happened at the end of the last chunk. And so the naive implementation will be serial, and I, I, even though I've got lots and lots of cores, I can get almost no parallelism here. Okay, I, can, I can do two things at once because I can be splitting one piece up and then processing the next piece, and that's about it. Um, so what can we do? Well, it turns out if you create yourself a little, um, uh, you, you could, you've got to change the problem so that it meets certain properties and then you can do things in parallel. So we're basically going to make it into a, a, a um, we're going to create ourselves a, an OO uh, data type which represents the chunks and segments. And basically what we're doing here is we're going to, the things that we can count, we will count, and the things at the front or the end are leftovers, and we just have to leave them there tagged as this still has to be processed. Now, for something that's only this many characters, this would uh, maybe not save you very much, but for bigger problems, often the piece that you do here, which is most of it, can be 99% of it, and the little end pieces are just a tiny little piece, right? It doesn't, doesn't look like that in this example. But if, so we, we're going to create segments and we're going to create chunks. And here's how you might do that in Groovy. The, the details aren't important. They're on the GitHub side and in the slides if you want to go and check the details up. But once we've gone and done that, basically we, we remember the, the status at, at either end and we process all the stuff in the middle. And um, what we can then do is uh, we can just take our words and uh, take the, our data structures and s split it up, do it in parallel, and combine them together. So we have to reduce them, flatten them back down. And we can do all of that in parallel um, because we've gone and adapted the algorithm very, very slightly. And what did we actually have to do to make this work? Well, it's, it's, it's in that picture. In order to be able to do things in parallel, anywhere where I've got a chunk, I need to be able to process two chunks and 
put them back into one and keep doing that. And if I'm on the end, I need a zero element. Okay? So basically, if I've got some zero or identity element and I've got an associative operator, I've got what's called a monoid. Right? And basically, so if, if you look at functional programming, it'll, it'll, it'll have various patterns like monoids and monads and applicators and functors. And what it means is, all it means is if, I, if I go and adapt my problem to be slightly different so that it's got these sort of properties, then I can just run it all in parallel as long as I've got pure functions there. So um, this is just trying to give you a flavor. And you're not trying to understand the details of this example. It just gives you the flavor of the kind of thing that you would do and the kind of things you get for free when you move over to this sort of style. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. Um, that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to cover. Um, so what, what's next? Um, go use, a, you know, even if you're not in the position where you can use a functional language in your work environment, I'd, re I'd encourage you to go and pick a functional language and learn it. If for no other reason the, uh, the, the style issues that uh, are forced upon you might be very, very useful for you to take back and use in your current languages. Even if you, you don't have the time to go and learn a new language, there's a lot of things that you can do to bring functional style into your current languages and there's quite a few benefits to, to many of those. Okay, keep, keep to the basics, keep things simple, but start looking at uh, some of these things, rethinking design patterns, starting to use these uh, persistent, immutable sort of paradigms. Um, but also use the appropriate tool. So here's a little bit of groovy code Cranes have two legs, tortoises have four legs, or seven animals, there are things. Solve, and it comes out with the answer. And if I go and write other lines in my code here, it you know, alters the answer. This happens to have a logic programming stuff underneath it. It's not functional. It could be imperative, it doesn't matter. This is the kind of thing that I'd be putting in front of the customer and getting them to verify, is this the problem that you want solved? You know, um, and how I implement that is, is less relevant. So I guess what I'm trying to emphasize here is don't get so wrapped up in the functional stuff that you lose track of what you're trying to do for a customer. And if, if what you're trying to do for the customer is going to be solved without using functional, don't, I'm, not for, I'm not forcing you to go use functional, but you will get lots of benefits if you do. Okay, thanks very much.